Uh, welcome also from me um, to this penultimate day of the school. I would like to start by saying we could have started with these, lecture, uh, with these lectures at the very beginning because I won't be assuming much from the first three days. I will only assume some basic familiarity with linear algebra and surfaces um, and some aspects of quantum field theory that I want to start with. So before I give you uh, a more, slightly more detailed outline, I want to recall some basic features of quantum field theory. So one feature of quantum field theory is that to physical space or to a spatial slice, one associates a space of states. So one assigns to physical space a space of states which in most semi-realistic applications is a Hilbert space possibly with more structure. I want to call it A because it will also have the structure of an algebra, as we'll see. Then another assignment is that to a process in space, so an evol um, evolution in space-time, a long time, one associates certain operators, unitary operators. So to evolution in time, we associate a unitary operator on the space of states A, which is of the form often e to the minus i over a constant h times t, t is time, and I want to call this operator u of t, unitary evolution along the time t, where the, uh, the h would often be interpreted as the Hamiltonian of the system that we consider. Uh, I give this a name because it illustrates one of the core features, core aspects of quantum field theory, namely that what happens um, in a bigger part of, of space-time of the universe can often be chopped up into, chopped up into smaller pieces. And doing this consistently goes under the name of locality. If we chop um, time intervals into smaller pieces, this manifests itself as follows. So it's, of, your, of course, a huge notion. And one aspect is that, for example, here, u t1 plus t2 is equal to first evolve for time t1 and then evolve for time t2 manifest from the formula for ut. This will be very important. Then something else that is probably very familiar that um, tensor products appear naturally in quantum physics, especially for um, independent systems, for example, systems of particles, many particles that go together. We're taught that they're described by tensor products or quotients thereof of the states, uh, the spaces of states of the individual particles. So very roughly for independent systems, we find that we're supposed to look at the tensor product, the, the ordinary tensor product over the complex numbers of such spaces and maybe more than two. Normally, when I think of locality, I think that, for instance, two observables that are separated so that 
Right. You're referring to the locality in the broader sense, um, where, where it's a property of correlators um, uh, evaluated at close by regions. But this is one of the core ideas behind that, that if something is close by, um, then it can be chopped up into these pieces. No? So, uh, so it's a caricature of the, local of the broader locality that you have in mind, as I try to indicate. But this caricature will be good enough for the motivations that I have in mind. So this is locality in quantum mechanics as opposed to higher dimensional quantum field theory, one could say. Then number five, something a bit more specific, in particular to two-dimensional conformal field theory, is the operator state correspondence. Which also goes by the name um, field state correspondence or state fields correspondence, um, as was discussed in some other lectures previously this week. Um, number six. Like I said, th this is specific to conformal field theory in particular and to the. Yeah, um, so this is the, the motivational part, and I allow myself um, not to be overly pedantic. Um, in CFT, we also saw the operator uh, uh, product expansion. Then in every formalization of quantum field theory that I know of, there's the notion of correlation functions or correlators. In many, in many ways to axiomatize QFTs, they play a foundational role. So for example, for states or fields, phi one, phi two, and so on, they might be denoted like this. Another crucial feature uh, that is central to many approaches to QFT is the path integral. Or in more discrete systems, state sums. Or Zustandsum in German, partition functions. And finally, I'm supposed to talk also about boundary conditions and defects and so on. So let me write this down. Boundaries, defects, etc. Yeah, you're asking about Lorentz or Poincaré um, um, invariance, and uh, thank you for bringing this up. I might have forgotten, so it's it's the next point. <laughs> so, these are the features of QFT or quantum theory by which I would like you to measure the success or lack thereof of these lectures. So, if I can say something reasonable from an algebraic or categorical point of view. On, on those, then I would measure it as success. If not, then less so. Um, and very roughly, the goal for these lectures, or I would claim to some extent for a large part of theoretical physics, is to understand a ha 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 Q of T as a map somehow from space-time to its algebraic description in terms of unitary operators on Hilbert spaces and so on. So space-time is some form of geometry. And vector spaces, unitary operators, and so on are algebraic notions. And as you point out, if, I want to, if we try to understand proper quantum field theories that actually seem to describe the physical world, 
um, then the geometry should involve um, lots of geometry and lots of symmetry. So for example, the, the geometry should be made up probably of Lorentzian manifolds, or if we talk about conformal field theory of um, uh, uh, manifolds with conformal structure, which in the two-dimensional case is a Riemann surface, or are Riemann surfaces. And on the algebraic side, we should discuss Hilbert spaces or Hilbert spaces with extra structure or properties, as we, as we learn in uh, quantum mechanics and QFT courses. But that's, so, so that's, that's a wonderful uh, thing to try and understand, but it's way too much for, for me in this lecture course, and much of this hasn't been rigorously understood by anyone, as far as I know. However, um, if we go to two dimensions, and if we only consider a much simpler, yet still far from trivial um, caricature of two-dimensional geometry with Lorentzian or Euclidean symmetries and so on, then I can say something about it. So if I consider a two-dimensional topological, I misjudged the, the, the space there. A two-dimensional topological quantum field theory is something that I want to uh, describe <laughs> in much detail today. Then this can be axiomatized as a certain map from a two-dimensional uh, um, theory of two-dimensional geometries to a theory of algebras. So that's the point of today that I explain what this means. <clears throat> And as I'll start um, describing, I will do this in terms of following uh, Atiyah, Siegel, Witten, and others uh, um, in terms of categories and functors. So I'm assuming that most of you are not familiar with this language. Um, hence, I will explain all of the notions as best as I can in the short time that we have together. Um, and before I go into some of the details, I would like to highlight three motivations why one would, might want to think about QFT or topological quantum field theory, which I will define uh, in, in these terms. First, um, it will be rigorous, and the rigor will allow us to stand on firm ground here, which is sometimes boring, but often very useful. Second, the conceptual clarity um, that this approach gives um, helps to navigate in the zoo of many topological quantum field theories and other QFTs. And third, the generality of the, the approach helps some people, at least, I'm one of them, um, to, uh, to have a clearer picture and to, to see structure that might otherwise be hidden, uh, as with the issue with the forest and the trees. So this approach has helped to understand um, uh, to, to uncover new dualities, for example, so re relevant constructions in QFT. However, uh, in this course, we won't have time to go into these applications, unfortunately. So it will about the general concept, the general ideas, and various examples. Okay. <laughs> so with this, let's get to the first definition. Oh, and I should say that later, I will add some more structure. So, but for today, it will just be a map um, from geometry to vector spaces uh, in a way uh, that I will describe. And before I now define what a category is, I would like to anticipate that category theory and functors and so on have a reputation, reputation of being overly or too abstract. And uh, I would agree with this, um, with this idea, at least to the extent that group theory is too abstract, which was a belief held by most physicists about 100 years ago. And as we'll see, um, the definition of a category is about as simple or in some directions simpler than that of a group. And while most modern physicists uh, nowadays uh, are quite familiar with basic notions and applications of group theory, uh, to the same extent, this hasn't happened with category theory, and I want to argue that it's worth at least going to this direction. And once we're more familiar with this, this, um, this, these notions and uh, the, the basic structure, then it will become very easy to manipulate that, just like most of you probably think it's very easy to work with SU2 or with cyclic groups or something like that. Okay, so a category, let's call it funny C, consists 
of some stuff, and this stuff has to satisfy certain axioms. So first of all, it consists of a possibly very large set whose elements are called objects. And the set is denoted OPC. <laughs> then for every pair of objects, for every pair of elements in this specified set, we get sets whose elements are called morphisms, sometimes also arrows. I'll call them morphisms. And it's denoted HOM AB for every pair of objects A and B of the category. Of course, I'll give examples very soon. Moreover, a category C also consists of composition maps. Between these sets of morphisms, or HOM sets, namely, if I have a set of morphisms from A to B, and another set of morphisms from B to C, then I should have a map to the morphisms from A to C that takes a morphism phi1 from A to B and the morphism phi2 from B to C and produces a morphism from A to C called the composition or composite of phi1 and phi2 denoted by a little circle or just by concatenation. And of course, this is true for every triple of objects A, B, and C um, in the category C, and I should write this here, but I don't, because it takes too much time, and you will probably know when I should write it. The final piece of datum that we need for a category is an identity, an identity for every object. So there are identity maps. denoted identity sub A for every object capital A, which is a morphism from A to A. And as usual, or as, uh, as is true also in many other situations, um, homomorphisms or morphisms from one thing to itself are called endomorphisms. So these are the pieces of data that a category consists of. And now I'll give you the axioms that they have to satisfy. The axioms state that the composition must be associative and the identities should be identities. That's it. Such that, first of all, whenever we, we have composable maps, for example, phi3 after phi2 composed with phi1, morphisms from A to B, from B to C, from C to D, for example. This must be the same morphism from A to D as composing phi3 with a composite of phi2 and phi1 whenever composable. So my handwriting is not perfect, but if it's particularly bad, then it's more or less on, on purpose because it should be clear, right? So this doesn't make sense if, um, for example, this year maps into something which is different from the domain of phi3. So if it can't start there, then we can't even write it down. And moreover, the identity morphisms are identities with respect to this composition. That means that for every morphism phi from A to B. If we compose the identity in B from the left with phi, this gives phi, which is the same as phi composed from the right with the identity on A. They are the identities. So that, that's the definition of a category. And before I give you specific examples, let me give you the rough idea maybe over here. One way to imagine a category with objects A, B, C, and so on, is that the objects, they label 
point, say on the plane or anywhere. So this is an object A, object B, object C. Then a morphism from A to B is an arrow from the point labeled A to the point labeled B. Here we have another morphism, phi 2 from B to C. And if we compose them, we get a morphism phi 2 after phi 1. That's the very rough idea. And this composition should be associative. And it could be many more, for example, also the identity on every object. Every object has the identity. There's at least one morphism to and from every object, namely the identity. You're asking whether the set of morphisms is a group. Yes. And it seems that the section over here is very good at anticipating the next thing that I want to write down. So let's see whether that's true. I want to give you examples. Three types of examples I want to write down. The first one starts with let G be a group. I omit articles and so on. Now, from a group, I can define a category. I can construct a category, sorry. I define this category and call it BG for reasons that I don't want to explain. That's standard notation. Um, BG is the category with well, four pieces of data, objects, morphisms, compositions, and identities. So what are the objects? There's only one, a single object that I could call anything. It's rather standard to call it bullet or dot or star, which means that the objects of the category BG, which I'm constructing, consists of just the, the singleton set has just one object. Moreover, what are the morphisms? Well, since there's only one object, all the morphisms start and end at this one object. And now I have to give a set. The set constructed from the group G is the set underlying the group G. I write this in this way. Then what is the composition of elements and the morphisms of this object, which are elements of the group? The composition, in this case, which is the third item in the definition above. This was the first and the second item. The composition is simply group multiplication. <coughs> which is associative, one of the axioms, because we are dealing with a group. And the identity um, on the only object that there is, is the identity of the group of G. So from the axioms of a group, it follows that this gives us a, a category. So um, there are more categories than there are groups. Obviously now, if I give you one other example at least, which doesn't involve groups. And you were asking whether um, the, the morphism sets actually have the structure of a group. And here comes uh, my, my uh, claim that categories are simpler than groups. For groups, you have to um, demand that multiplication is invertible. So there exists inverses. We're not demanding this here, right? So. A category has more objects than a group because, well, there's more labels, A, B, and so on, upstairs. But it's simpler in the sense that we're not asking for inverses. So no, the home sets do not need to have the structure of a group. There's a question. Um, I don't really follow. So you only have a single object, which is point. Uh -huh. right? And you're looking at the endomorphism from point to point. Yes. Well, I would expect that there is only, if you have a set with just one object, there should only one map from that object. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, so you're saying, um, how can it be that if you have just the one point, that um, it can have more arrows from the point to itself than just the identity? Um, first of all, nowhere in the definition does it say that there can only be one morphism from A to A for every object, but there has to be at least one. And the idea is that if you have some group element little g, then you can denote, uh, then the picture that, that describes this category BG has, has, um, has this as a subpart of it. But of course, you can also have a different uh, element H of the group. And then you can compose that. And uh, this could be, for example, G after H. So you just, can, um, in your mind, you can have a multidimensional picture of this one point with lots of arrows, uh, loops at it. That, that's perfectly fine. Just like in any space, you can pick a point and then look at many paths that start and end at, at the same point. Incidentally, I'm more or less describing the uh, first, uh, the fundamental group that was discussed in the, on the first or second day. <coughs> Is that okay? Okay. So that's that simple type of of category. Here's another simple type that we're very familiar with, namely the one that features over there already. So now I define what vect is. Vect is a category. With objects, morphisms, compositions, and identity. The objects are vector spaces. So this category is named after its objects. More specifically, I want to uh, uh, in our situation, talk only about complex vector spaces, which are relevant in physics. Vector spaces. A very familiar notion. Then what is the set of morphisms from a vector space V to a vector space W? By definition, it's the set of linear maps from V to W. It probably doesn't come as a surprise. How do you compose linear maps between vector spaces? By concatenating them. So the composition in the category vect is the composition of linear maps. And the identity endomorphism on a vector space is the identity, would you help me, clean the blackboard? Clean the blackboard? Yes, thank you. Because I, I want to make a point now. Maybe this one? Yes. Yeah, th thanks a lot. I'll need the top one later. Th there's, there's a question? I'm not restricting to finite dimensional vector spaces at this point. You're describing that you can think of the point in example one to have more structure. You were giving a sensible idea. I, you, yeah. I can also imagine that it has something to do with my favorite band, but it's not relevant to the example, okay. right? So it's, it's just that, it's just very basic, right? I think it makes it more clear to me that the group elements can map differently. On oh, yeah, oh, I see. So, so you, you want to have an action of a group on something that is extra structure, which is uh, an example in 15 minutes from now. Okay, uh, thanks. So maybe sometimes there's a confusion that um, uh, you want to think of a homomorphism as a map from one space to the other. Oh, right. And this is, of course, not in this sense, right? Yes, this. thanks. Um, this, uh, so I wanted to use the time with the blackboard to say that in addition to this example of vector spaces, there are many other similar examples, for example, the category of groups and group homomorphisms as objects and morphisms, or the category of rings and ring homomorphisms, or of smooth manifolds and smooth maps, 
or of group representations and intertwining maps and so on. They are all um, named after their objects, like Vect. And as Stefan pointed out, um, there's no need that um, the, the morphisms act on something. They're just sets and you can compose them by the axiom that he erased. Um, and the next example gives, uh, the, the example number three will give us an example where we do not have maps as morphisms, but something else. So if you try to digest the next example, then th this might help. But there's another question. But just to clarify, the composition is assumed to be a function. Yes, it's a map. Map and function are used interchangeably on sets. Composition is a function. In the example of the vector spaces, if I have uh, two objects that are basically vector spaces of the same dimension, are they the same object? I mean, is this defined modulo sum? No. The, okay. No, no. If, if something is defined modulo something, then I say it. <laughs> so it's just all vector spaces are the objects, and the home sets are really the sets of linear maps. So now. <laughs> Now I will uh, define something modulo something. Here's the example of the Bordism category in two dimensions. So now I want to define this category Bord2. This is the category that, is, that has objects, morphisms, composition, and identity. Objects are easy. Objects are disjoint unions blah, 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 of something. So disjoint unions of oriented circles as one. What does that mean? Well, a circle looks like this. I don't draw the orientation. If I have more than one circle, then I draw then more than one circle, and they're not, they're not embedded into something, they're just circles, just the mathematical object of a circle. So if I have five of them, then I take the disjoint union of five of them. I could have only one, or only two, or only zero. That's also allowed. Now the main point here in this definition of the Bordism category is what the morphisms are. Morphisms between any finite number, uh, finite disjoint unions of circles. Morphisms are compact oriented surfaces with possibly with boundary, could also be empty with boundary, and I will have to add something here in a minute. So, for example, what's a morphism from, say, three circles to one circle? I draw three circles downstairs, one circle upstairs, and I will write, uh, read every diagram, every surface that I draw from bottom to top, just like usually we read from left to right in English and from right to left in mathematics. Um, so here's a sketch of a genus one surface that has four boundary components. Three I draw downstairs, one I draw upstairs. And this, I claim, has something to do with morphisms from three circles to one circle. And I follow the standard convention of denoting disjoint union by these uh, square cups. Now the point, I'll have to say what composition is and so on, but now I come, come to the point that we're talking about, that I want to talk about topological quantum field theory. So this circle is different from the circle where I deform this a little bit continuously. Or I could deform it a lot, right? So these are obviously three different circles that I just drew but they're all diffeomorphic to one another. You can continuously put this bulge back into the surface without changing the topology. You're not adding holes or um, getting away with holes. So this is why this surface, which, which uh, maybe which you shouldn't draw like this uh, in your notes, 
um, is the same as the one that I draw at the beginning, up to diffeomorphism. So up to diffeomorphisms relative to the boundary. So they leave the boundary fixed. But I don't want to explain in detail now what this means. So whenever I think it's very difficult or impossible to understand what I mean precisely, uh, I try to draw a sign like this. Um, but in the exercises, we'll discuss this in more detail. So, I was wondering whether things like sharp angles or pitchings and so on are forbidden. I mean, they're counted as different. Yeah, they're compact oriented surfaces, and by this I mean smooth manifolds. So, so there's, there's no singularities allowed because by surface I mean smooth manifold. Thanks. So, uh, are the objects of your category labeled by integers, just the number of circles? Or could you have a, two different uh, objects with the same number of circles? You're asking whether basically this category has as objects integers named, uh, or natural numbers, namely the number of circles, or whether there are different kinds of circles. And I can't tell you what. I told you um, what the definition is, but we can't yet answer that question because I haven't told you how to compose the morphism, so I, I can't tell you yet what an isomorphism even would be. But let me come back to this in a minute. So, so we are really looking at diffeomorphism classes of such surfaces, but usually I won't draw the square brackets. Yes? That's a, it's a very good question. You're asking, if I talk about smooth manifolds, then I have a differential structure, so atlases, uh, and so on. Um, and you're asking whether it's unique. Well, uh, for a circle, it's unique. That's a, that's a theorem. And for surfaces, so it comes with a structure of a smooth manifold up to diffeomorphisms. Then you can ask, do two um, different... Uh, to uh, identical topological spaces, can they be endowed with different smooth structures? In two dimensions, that's not the case, as far as I know. Um, that's also a theorem. Um, but there's also the question how to endow the composite that I'm about to discuss now with such a structure. And it would have been even better for you to ask the question after the next point, but it was a good question already now, like most questions are. So what is composition? The composition is defined in a way that we can't explain in, in detail, but I can give you the intuition by gluing surfaces together. So for example, if I have a surface which looks like a pair of pants from two circles to one circle, and if I have another surface from one circle to one circle, but maybe with one hole in the middle, so it has genus one, if I compose that, uh, what is it by definition? By definition, we glue that surface on top of that surface. So composition is gluing, which means that the composite looks like this. We just take the incoming boundary and sue it or glue it to the outgoing boundary. And how exactly this is done, um, I don't want to explain. It take, takes too long. And whether and how many smooth structures there are here that, that we can then mod out by diffeomorphisms is also something that, that we're not discussing now together. But we can, and it's in the references, of course. OK, finally. So I, I always read um, surfaces and other diagrams from bottom to top. So bottom is incoming, top is outgoing. That's part of the definition of the morphism. Huh? Yes. Okay. Uh, what about the definition? If you have two outgoing boundaries, how do you necessarily glue? Really? Yeah. So if, if there's, there's more than one boundary component, ingoing or outgoing, like here, for example, in, in pictures, it's clear there will be one to the left and one to the right, and you um, glue the left to the left and the right to the right. But how to do it properly, one has to discuss 
exactly what these diffeomorphism equivalence classes are and how the gluing works. I think this takes, to do it properly, at least one lecture. And we really have, don't have time for that, unfortunately, because I want to at, le at least get to boundary TQFT, um, so open TQFT and, and how to describe them algebraically. But in, in the exercises, of course, we will do it. Yes? Yes, um, the question is about the orientation of the surfaces and they feature prominently in the definition of what it means to be ingoing and outgoing. So, so I would like to stop every other question about orientation of surfaces and how to glue them. And for, for the lecture course, please simply um, try and think in terms of, this pic of these pictures. Uh, it's always from bottom to top and you put things on top of other things and that's gluing. Um, if you swallow that, then you can understand that the identity, the identities, they are defined to be cylinders. I give two examples. First, what is the identity on one single circle? <clears throat> it's a cylinder in the most basic way, so what is called a cylinder in school. It's a surface with incoming and outgoing uh, boundary, um, the circle, and it's just a cylinder in between. But of course, we also have other morphisms, uh, other objects, for example, made up of two circles. What's a cylinder over any surface? It's just taking um, some interval times it. So that means that we have, as in pictures, just two cylinders. Circle one, circle two, ingoing. Circle one, circle two, outgoing. We take a cylinder over that, just Cartesian product um, with the surface. Excuse me. Yes, yes. Um, in, in the board, so not in general, but in the category board two. The, the objects are disjoint unions of circles, and in particular, no circle is a disjoint union, namely of zero circles. So the empty set is, is an object, that's true. So for example, we, we could have put <coughs> a cap on top of here. Then it would go from two to one, and from one to zero circles. That, that, thank you. Goodness. Okay, um, so these are three types of examples of categories, including the two that we will need to talk about TQFT. Um, the next step is, um, now that we have some mathematical object that I have tried to argue makes sense because we are familiar with surfaces and with, uh, with uh, vector spaces and so on, now we ask what are maps that preserve the structure? We know what a, a map between groups is that preserves the group structure, namely a group homomorphism. First multiply, then map is the same as first map and then multiply. Mu multiply. Um, in the case of categories, maps between categories which preserve the structure are called functors. Here's the definition. Oh, and... So that, I think that's good enough as motivation for the definition, but also physically it will encode locality as I try to um, make a character out of it earlier. So this, is, this will be at the root of formalizing lo locality. Let C and D be categories. So they each come with objects, morphisms and so on. A functor from C to D, denoted, say, F, also is made up of certain data subject to certain axioms, which I think might all fit on the left of this board. So first, it's a map or a function between the objects. I don't give a name to it. 
we have the set of objects of C and the set of objects for D. Um, and we take an object, say, A in here, and we map it to an object of D, which is denoted F of A, if the functor is called F. Moreover, we have functions between the HOM sets, the sets of morphisms. So for every pair of objects A and B and C, we get a pair of objects F of A and F of B in the category D. And sometimes to know where we're at, we can add a subscript to the category, uh, to the home, to know in which category we're taking home. Often we don't do this because it clutters, it's, uh, it's cluttery notation. What does it do? Well, it's a function, that's it. It takes a morphism and sends it to a morphism that is also called f of that thing. And that's the data. And now this data of a functor should be compatible with the category structure. And the, the structure is that there are compositions between the, the home sets. And these functions here, they should be compatible with that. So the axioms are that first, if we first compose two morphisms in C, this is the same thing as first mapping and then mapping with F to D, which is the same thing as first mapping and then composing. So this here is in C, and this is the composition in D. <clears throat> it's very much like the group homomorphism property. And finally, a functor also maps the identity on every object to the appropriate identity, namely of, on the object f of a, if the object is called a. <clears throat> uh, if I have one or two more minutes, I'll explain how every representation of a group is a functor. Do I have one or two more minutes? You can, take, uh, you can shift where the break is uh, by a few minutes. Oh, great. Thank you. So, so that's... That's a sensible definition of a structure preserving maps, a map between categories. Here's an example. Let's take um, two of the categories that we've discussed already, namely BG for group G and VECT. Let G be a group, any group. Then a functor, I call it rho, not F from the category BG, which has just one object, and the endomorphisms are the group elements, to the category of vector spaces, I claim this is a G representation. In the usual sense, a representation of the group G. And if you like, you can view this um, example as a lemma, and now I prove this lemma. <coughs> First, I look at the object that rho assigns to the single object of BG. It was denoted bullet. Um, rho maps an object here to an object here, so this will be a vector space. So I call it V. And then uh, rho now viewed as a function from uh, the home spaces on the left hand side to the home spaces, uh, sorry, home sets on the right hand side is now a function from G because G is equal to uh, end in here in the category BG, but we don't have to write this. Uh, a functor sends endomorphisms on the left-hand side to endomorphisms of, on the right-hand side. Functor of that object. But this was defined to be a vector space V. 
So now we have endomorphisms of the vector space V, which is a good start, right? <coughs> what we have now, given a group and such a functor, we get a vector space and a map from the group into the endomorphisms. And it's a functor, so this functoriality property is satisfied, which means that um, functor applied to um, morphism composed with morphism is functor applied to morphism composed with functor applied to morphism. Now, of course, we call the morph morphisms G and H. These are group elements. And this is rho of G after rho of H. And that's precisely um, part of the definition of what a representation of a group G is, that for all elements G and H of the group, this holds. So it, and from this one finds that it's actually a map into the automorphisms. That ends the proof. All right, are there any questions? Then I would say we take a one minute break and come back because I didn't get very far. Is that okay? <laughs> Probably we're taking a, a 15 minute break. See you in a bit. <laughs>